Uh, I'm, I just wanted to say from the start that, that I'm not a nerd, um, which might sound negative to you, but you can see that I'm from a technical university and actually it's kind of considered strange not to be a nerd when you're at a technical university, but I'm not a nerd. So it's a good thing that we had already the two presentations about what this is about because I'm not going to tell you about the technology or the techniques or anything like that. I'm just going to talk to you about some ideas and probably it's a, it's a little bit uh, an overstatement and Danes normally don't overstate so Peter has been living now for 10 years in the US. If he had been in Denmark he would never have said I would, was the founder of this. There is no founder of GMI. We have been a group of people, actually almost like 300 researchers in this area, lots of nerds and then a few non-nerds that have been thinking about this idea and, and is trying to move it forward. And, and I hope that uh, it'll move forward uh, faster now, although it has actually moved fairly fast already, as you will see. Now, the first thing is to say that uh, when we have good science, and it looks like in this area we are getting some very exciting science, we should actually use that to solve problems. Uh, that, that is the main statement at our university in uh, Copenhagen, the Technical University of Denmark, that what we should be doing should be helping society, society in general. Uh, this was said by uh, the former Mi Mexican Minister of Health, Julio Frank, who was also working at the WHO at some stage, and now he's Dean of Howard, as you can see. But then do we have any problems to solve, or is everything just moving on nicely? Well, in fact, I would say that in relation to surveillance systems, both in relation to human health and food safety, we really have some problems that we might want to solve if we had some good solutions available. Uh, and the thing is that a lot of these surveillance systems that we would like to use in promotion of good health or good food safety actually need to have some sort of a global set uh, set up. I think that it's uh, not going to work in the future if we have national, even national in the US is a huge nation, national systems. National systems are not going to work in the future. It has to be international for a number of different reasons. Not only because I worked in WHO, I really think, you know, that if you think about it, uh, if you want to have prevention in relation to health or in relation to food safety, you need to actually go global. So do we have some new opportunities in this area? Clearly, you have already been told about this, maybe not about Jimi Hendrix, but uh, we start back in 53 with Watson and Crick. We had Sanger there who actually got two Nobel Prizes. Can you imagine a guy getting two Nobel Prizes in two different areas? Must be a strange guy. Uh, and then, 90 to 2003, we had the big human genome project. We heard about that. And then just after that, uh, the next generation sequencing moves in. And uh, that looks like, maybe not like this, but like that. And now we have a lot of different machines. They, lo they look differently. I don't know how to operate them. I don't have to. I'm just talking about the ideas. Uh, there was a huge reduction in cost just when this came out, and as you can see here, even faster than Moore's law, the cost has been going down. It's also been alluded to by others already this morning. So even just the cost will probably drive this change, and we believe, lots of people believe, that the change will happen over the next 10, 15 years. So basically it can happen in a stupid way, or it can happen in a smart way, and we are trying to argue for the smart way. So it's a major paradigm shift in relation to uh, microbiology. Basically, we're shifting from Pasteur to Watson, or Pasteur and Koch to Watson and Crick, if we want to also include the Germans in this. Uh, I guess the plate, uh, you know, spreading on the plate was actually invented in Koch's uh, uh, laboratory, I guess. And we're still doing that. At least we did that when I got my PhD, which is, of course, also a long, long time ago. But we're still doing it. We're using the technology from 1870. 
1870. There are not many areas of science where we're still using the same old technology. Now, I know that, uh, I mean, looking at different types uh, of DNA uh, methodology, we have been doing that for some time, but really this is the big move now. So it comes, I mean, the machines here come at the same time as we have an opportunity to move very big uh, data over the web, which means that we have two major opportunities coinciding at the same time, which is now. So it means we need to get our act together and do something smart. Um, so our suggestion is that we, we could create a global database or a system of global databases that would contain the DNA codes of all microbiological strains, of all microbiological strains. I kid you not. We put this in, we, we, this is the outcome of, a, of an expert meeting. I mean, this is not me saying it. This is an expert meeting saying this. Okay, it could have been, uh, this one was a small one, the first GMI meeting actually. It could have been 30 stupid people getting together, but I think they were pretty smart. <laughs> I know some of them were smart. Eric was there, he was smart. Um, so th this is a, a notion that could move um, so we are, of course, we are going away from the old stuff, uh, the Pasteur stuff, the Koch stuff, and we might not even need pure culture. We might not even need uh, culturing in the future. That'll also be a debate on in itself, but we might not need that. We, we will be able to do things significantly faster than before. It's going to be one test that fits all, including viruses. Are there any virologists here? Sometimes, yeah, that's very good. Do you, do you agree that virology is part of microbiology? Okay, but uh, we, we sometimes have some discussions within the group of GMI and, and some of the virologists say that, uh, no, 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 we are, we are totally different. And of course, in a, <laughs> maybe you are different, but uh, it's, it's significantly more difficult to work with viruses. I understand that. I come from bacteriology. That's so much simpler. But I mean, in this, in this way, you would get into a technology that basically is exactly the same whether you're talking about viruses or bacteria. And it's all different types of microbiology that w use this, we believe. So what could be the advantages? It's one single technique, uh, relatively, relatively simple. I can say that since I'm not working with it. Uh, it would be the same across the One Health uh, system where we would look at animals, food, humans, in the same way, which has been a big problem in the past to do that. It would be the same in different countries. Why do I say that? Well, I remember back in the old good salmonella times, even within a small country like Denmark, you would have some people at State Serum Institute, the stupid doctors, they would use some plates. And then you would have some other people at the Royal Veterinary and Agricultural University, the smart veterinarians, they would use some other plates. I mean, even in a small country, we were like 10 kilometers apart, we were using different plates. So could we compare our results? No, we could not. And certainly we didn't want to because they were stupid. <laughs> That's what you said, isn't it? Oh, I don't know, yeah. Okay, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be uh, also between fields of research, we were just uh, listening to some one field of research that would be building a, a huge uh, database system which is really good. But would it make sense to have 25 or 100 different systems being built in the world over the next 20 years? I don't think so. I think it would really make sense to have one system being built. And of course, uh, the comparisons that we would have between these different things will be totally off the chart. I cannot even start to imagine what you can actually do with this data in the future. And I probably believe that most people here cannot imagine that because that's going to be a totally new ball game. Will we start understanding the microorganisms as small machines and the interaction with humans in a totally new way? But I'm not talking about that. Now I'm just talking about whether we can actually give the microorganisms the right names. So uh, treatment of, of infections will be dramatically improved Potentially, foodborne outbreak investigation will improve dramatically. 
Surveillance and prevention in general in the whole area will be improved. Uh, and of course, the whole research area will be improved because we get a totally new tool. So the idea of globally following diseases or following pathogens is of course already out there. And until now, we have mainly used at the international level, we have mainly used information and rumors to tell us how microorganisms or diseases are spread. But in the future, actually, this type of technology would give us a, poss a possibility to actually have a real-time lab-based system that would tell us how the diseases spread. So we would have global surveillance, also foodborne surveillance. We would uh, be able to maybe in the future predict vi virulence in a totally different way, tracing routes of transmission, analyze uh, the structures of the different populations of microorganisms, and so on. And then my main point would be, it's really not going to work in the smart way to try to do something like this if it's not done globally, if it's not done across all sectors, if it's not done soon, and uh, if it's not done open source. So I'm not saying that all of these things are very easy, you, we should just do this or that. Uh, I, I'm putting them up as major problems and issues that we the collective we need to deal with in some way. So the suggestion about the, a system that we have called until now the Global Microbial Identifier is basically suggesting two lines of action. The first one is that you would be able to identify your microorganism, including the resistance in that microorganism, whether you are in Botswana in a veterinary lab or in Indiana in a human health lab. It would enable a reduction in time and cost, and it would probably give us more correct characterization in the future. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, if you did that in one database or a system of databases that are linked together, you would then also have what I was talking about, the real-time global or national surveillance of disease and pathogen development, as well as antimicrobial resistance. So I'm saying open source. Lots of people will say this is never going to work. A global open source infrastructure, you know, who are you to talk about something, you know, open source, can, can we do that at all? Um, I'm sure that in a number of other areas of society, we are also talking about open source and, and how much information we can actually look at, how much information government can look at. But in some areas like this, there are actually some examples where there has been open source, even if societies or governments uh, believe that some of these areas are very important, maybe even for national security. So one example that was taken up in one of our GMI meetings is the, 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 the system of uh, meteorological data, which is basically now a total open source uh, system, so that anybody in the world can make models. And when you have uh, some storm moving into the east coast of the US, you will have all these different models, and they are very different in the beginning. And they are from China, from Japan, from US, from Europe. Different researchers are basically using the same data because it's open source. And then, of course, later on, you'll see that they will converge, and you will find out who did the right thing from the beginning. And it might be some people in Japan or in US or whatever. But it's realized that in this area, even with data that some might say could be very important for the military, yeah. meteorological data or things like that, you, we're still trying to create or have created a system that is basically open source, which gives us a lot of opportunity to use the data in new ways uh, for all the researchers all over the world to the benefit of societies all over the world. And then the other thing is, it's not like we have to start from scratch. It's not like nothing has happened yet. Well, actually, already we have NCBI, we have GenBank in NCBI. They're linking up with EBI in Europe and DDBJ in Japan. Uh, every day, I didn't know that before, but every day they actually mirror their databases. Every 24 hours, they mirror all these databases. This is a huge amount of data. 
and new data coming in daily into these databases. And this is already working. Of course, this is not GMI. This is not the system that I'm talking about. But it's at least showing that we already have systems where we can share, share these huge data uh, over borders uh, between the different parts of the world. So not saying that it's without problems. Uh, when we have this data, which will tell us something about a new disease or something that's in food that would move over borders, of course, there will be limited willingness from some governments to share these data, maybe even limited willingness from most governments to share these data because they know that it'll mean something. It'll mean something for their food export or for their uh, tourism sector or whatever. Uh, but we really need to have open access if we want the system also to work as an early warning system. So the data could be attractive in relation to public health, in relation to food safety, but really it could also be very attractive in relation to the food industry. And we know that one third of all food in the world is actually fermented, and fermented means that we've used some microorganisms in them. And how do we actually get them? In the old days, you would just, you know, take some random microorganism, and if it was good to do this or that, then you'd use it, and we're still doing that. In the future, you would be able to actually construct or at least look at the microorganisms and find out which ones would have the right uh, systems to actually deal with this type of food and give us a new type of food or a better type of food or healthier type of food. So it's going to be usable in relation to public health food safety area, but it's really also going to be usable in a number of different areas. So uh, we believe that uh, there will be a shift towards uh, bioinformatics, like we heard just before. We also believe that really uh, the, the bridges between these often separate research areas, clinical microbiology, lab science, epidemiology, will be broken down by this if we do it the right way. That's been a big problem in the past, and I know from discussions with Peter Garner smith that uh, when they introduced uh, some of the pulse field new thinking, some of the big problems was actually to have the discussions between the microbiologists and the epidemiologists. And because suddenly you have a totally new tool, and it takes time to find out how you can actually use that. We believe the same will happen here, and maybe even in a much bigger uh, scale. And we can do it globally. Why do we need to do it soon? Well, as you have already heard this morning, or maybe have heard if you've been at other meetings in this area, this is already happening out there. So we already, st or some people are already starting to, to, to build separate databases. And of course, that has to go on. Uh, that, I mean, it's not like we're suggesting you should stop this and we'll uh, have a, a waiting period for the next five years until somebody find out what the system is. You have to do this. but. At the same time, we should really understand that we should also have the international standardization system trying to look at it. So if, if we end up building a lot of separate systems, in 20 years' time, we will look at it and say, wouldn't it be a fantastic idea if all these could be linked together? And we should have done it from now, because if we do it from the start, it is just so much easier than if you have to change everything afterwards. And then another important uh, thing which becomes more and more important is that if we are just doing it in the different sectors and we are not trying to look at it at the international level, we will again be leaving developing countries behind this development. Why could that be important, especially in developing countries? Well, there is really what we would call a leapfrog potential because in uh, developing countries, the current diagnostics are clearly not as uh, advanced as in the rich countries. And uh, we know that if we want to introduce the old system, we need to have different experts. We need to have an expert in each area, developed, educated, and paid in a developing country. Is that really necessary? Actually, if NGS was introduced over the next five to 10 years, you would have the same system for diagnosis of all microorganisms. So uh, we need not be limited by the systems that are already in place. It's a fantastic opportunity for them. Uh, and then, of course, you could also set up systems in these countries where microbiologists, epidemiologists are actually working uh, 
the systems together. Um, at the systemic level, we will have, we could have uniform uh, reporting, surveillance systems, laboratory systems that we would actually build from scratch in developing countries. And the same systems would work for animals, food, humans, so it would really be uh, the one health paradigm there. New uh, diagnostic systems will be simplified. We will have real-time characterization of microorganisms in decentralized labs with sequences and internet link-up if we have that. So that's maybe one of the big problems in some developing countries, whether you have the bandwidth there, but that's something that will be solved. So the GMI uh, thinking is virus, bacteria, parasites, it's all the same. You can go to this uh, website if you want to see more about the initiative, and I'll just tell you a few more slides after that. But um, we believe it's a major uh, opportunity. So just to say, GMI is just some ideas being presented. So if we have some of the thinkers here, Eric Brown or Peter Gerner or some like these, we are basic, let's just uh, start with the, the idea. The idea is that we have a patient or food, we use whole genome sequencing to actually access the databases in the cloud. This will give us a diagnosis, which of course will go directly back to the patient or to the food that we're talking about. But it would also go to surveillance systems that again would move their data back to the database. This is the relatively simple idea uh, this is uh, an opportunity that we have. We have a, a time uh, window just now that we could do that maybe over the next five years in a really smart way. So what we are doing uh, at the moment is basically trying to put these seeds into wherever we uh, go. It could be into scientific community, but also into the political level, because we really believe that one of the biggest issues in the future will be whether the political level will actually accept that something like this could be made in a truly international way. Uh, so at the moment, the GMI is at the stage where we are trying to describe the landscape and create a roadmap that maybe could lead there. And this will take time, but we have lots of uh, dedicated people who are working there. So we had, we've had actually since 2011, when we had the first meeting, we have now had uh, six meetings, uh, fifth in Copenhagen, sixth in California, number seven will be in York next month, and we will be analyzing the landscape and suggesting how to move forward with uh, an organization. An organization. We, the system that we have is we have uh, five working groups, four of them for the nerds, and one, the first one for the non-nerds, uh, we are trying to do these things, and a lot of it is actually moving fast uh, forward, but of course, we don't have a major structure. We don't have funding or anything like that. This is just people getting there for these meetings on their own money. We don't have any money to move anyone. Maybe we can move somebody from the U.S. because they don't have so much money to travel or from maybe some developing, <laughs> yeah, okay. It's an internal joke, yeah, but sometimes it's very difficult to move people in the US. It's actually easier to move people from developing countries than in the US, well, that's a, that's a strange thing. But um, this, these are the working groups uh, and uh, we are trying to work forward. So what, what I'm saying is that the political issue is probably gonna be key. Uh, there is really a big opportunity to start this globally. That's also why we have WHO, FAO, OIE are directly involved in the system and they are in our steering committee. Uh, if we start a global uh, startup, we will be able to have local diagnostics, global surveillance, cheaper, better, faster, uh, microbiology, and the link to epidemiology. This could be the first big global machine with local use, unless you count Google as a global machine, I don't know, uh, but only if we can move forward uh, together. So we should try to move forward in, in continuous improvement, just like our forefathers did you see they really moved out and improved things all over the world. I'm not sure that the people that received them perceive it like that, but, uh, but, <laughs> but they did actually bring lots of culture apart from all the other things they did. Thank you very much. <laughs>